Hey there, and welcome back to our continuing coverage from Dice Tower 2018, the only convention that doesn't need a funny little tagline after you say the name of the convention. So, uh, we're but, doing... But that was the tagline. Did, did that too. <laughs> let's move on. To Luke from a Portal Games, who's here to join us to talk about Monolith Arena. Before you jump in, Luke, Chaz, you know, I said at the end of each day, we need to make a correction. I need to make a correction right now. Okay. I was e excited to hear about this game, Luke, because mm -hmm. sure. I love Nurashima Hex. Sure. For some reason in my head, I assumed that this was in the Nurashima Hex universe, but as you sat down and politely corrected me that this is Nurashima Hex type mechanics, but in a different universe. So tell us all about it. That's yes. right. You won't be disappointed if you're a Nurashima Hex fan. Um, because in addition to finally having printed all 12 expansion armies all at once for Nurishima Hex, so all the completionists can have an entire collection, mm -hmm. we're now introducing Monolith Arena, which has Nurishima Hex mechanics applied to a fantasy theme, and with Michael Orach creating this incredible new totem mechanism that is going to really add a lot to the gameplay. So, Nurishima Hex applied to fantasy, meaning we have the traditional kind of fantasy factions, so you have the Dwarven Guardians, the Dark Forest with the Elves, you have the Human Faction, the Human Empire, and then you also have these Lords of the Abyss. So, new factions, four completely new play styles, and now we also have these additional monolith mechanics. So, Nurishima Hex fans can play this in the traditional Nurishima Hex way, also new players to the line can play this just the way they normally play Nurishima, where they're setting up their bases, they're doing the random draw, and they just have a great time with these factions. So the elves are focusing on movement and mobility and attacking from a distance and range. You have the dwarves here who are really good at hunkering down and they have a lot of toughness and really powerful units. You have the human faction that has an incredible new mechanism called charge where they have cavalry units that mm. they can just attack individually. They have to actually have space to move in and then they can attack but you can initiate combat with just for individual cavalry units as opposed to combat for the entire board. Oh, really tricky oh, faction to play. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And that comes a lot into play because if you have modules that, for example, with this faction that is all about poisoning and blocking and interfering, if you have something like this guarding this HQ, you might actually be able to do this to where if a unit wants to charge in, he'll immediately be poisoned by this rune, as we call them. So these are now not HQs, they're banners. And now these aren't modules, these are runes, which kind of re okay. everything to the fantasy theme. Okay. So you can still play it the original way, and it's going to be a blast because you've got so much new, so many new abilities and so many new things to work with. But yeah. what we also now have is this monolith game mode. So this is actually extremely cool. I love playing with this because what happens now is you have your monolith, and again, this is a advanced production, co uh, advanced pre-production copy, but it's still a prototype. So. Mm -hmm. We've got really cool monoliths, but that's 3D printed, and um, all of these are still not completely finished. Right. But uh, what you'll actually be able to do is insert your banner, and then before the start of the game, you will actually choose units to insert into your monolith, or runes to insert into your monolith, and then you will simply stack them. Your opponent will not know what you're putting in, and then this goes onto the board underneath your banner. So what it means now is that you can still manipulate this as you would in a normal game with movement uh, commands, but at some point during the game now, it's up to you. You can choose to break apart your monolith in any way you want to, as long as they're connecting, and that adds a lot of control over the battlefield. You still have that random element where you're drawing three tiles, mm -hmm. and it's that's still that chance element, but now you have so much more control over the strategies you put together. And there's so many wicked combos you can pull off of this. So having, this was a particularly bad one that I did because this is giving boost to range, but this unit has no range. But if I have this unit, this sorcerer, and if I have this module that is boosting range by one, and if I add, insert this into my monolith, if I've broken that apart now at the right time, if I initiate a combat command, all of a sudden I'm ready to really do some damage. Better yet, if I have a rune that boosts 
it's somewhere in here. If I have a rune that <laughs> boosts this into actually a gauze cannon, all of a sudden this becomes a unit that it fa uh, affects through an entire line. So after battle, all of these monoliths fold back up, and this just adds a lot of really interesting things you can do. A lot of combos you can pull off, a lot of strategies you can kind of pre-plan and have a way to control some of that random element. All right, so I have a quick question. Uh, one, uh, uh, when you deploy the monolith, mm -hmm. does it, uh, you have to have the space to get it deployed? Yes. So uh, you do have to have the room. So that's one uh, method that somebody has to come. If somebody comes in and blocks you off, right. if you don't have where to place the monolith, then you're in trouble. Also, if, you, if you're too early in the way you break out your monolith, uh, after a combat command, everything will have to come right back in and fold up again. But if during the battle, something happens, uh, or if during, if before the battle you have an empty space, your opponent can actually place one of their units oh. within this if you don't have any units to place, which then when you're folding up, that no makes way. it much more difficult. Yeah, you can still control where it's pointing, but you do have an enemy unit inside your monolith, so <laughs> that's definitely not a good situation to be in. And it reset, you said it resets after each round, so once you deploy it, it's not like I've deployed it and it's out there forever. You're going to reset and still have the ability to strategically change it around in future rounds? So it resets after uh, after, com after a combat. After command. combat. Yeah, so okay. I can choose to, uh, at some point during the round after playing the game, I can choose to break these apart mm -hmm. and leave them broken apart. Yeah. And after combat, it all comes back together. It has to. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you can you can unfold the monolith much earlier. And if you have if you have a strategy that's focused on runes, that's why you would might want to do that. You might yeah. want to fold it out earlier. Is there any way, like you mentioned, if um, one of the units in the monolith gets destroyed, you mentioned how your enemy could sneak in there. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that if you get an empty spot to get one of your own units back inside of it? Sure. So uh, you always have priority. Okay. So if after battle, you've had your monolith spread out, unfolded, and then this unit gets taken out. Battle's over, you will fold back. Okay. And then you know you have that empty slot. So next time you open up, as long as you have that uh, a unit you can put in there, you have priority. But if you don't, uh, for whatever reason, because of a bad draw and you just really make that decision that you want to unfold, that's when your opponent can place one of his in there. I see. Okay. Yeah. So. You do have priorities, so it is, um, it's up to the strategy. If you want to do that, you can, but otherwise it's usually not a good move. So the monolith feature really adds a lot to the game, adds a lot of variety, adds a lot of strategies. We were talking back and forth when we were playing this uh, before the convention about all the cool things we can try, all the cool combos you can have. With these charge units, there's a module in here that gives an eternal charge to one unit. So these. These units are very difficult to optimize, okay. but you have a lot of different strategy and a lot of different things you can do with this one. Um, these units, they're completely different in play style, unlike anything we've had in the Hiroshima Hex universe. So. I was gonna ask, how does how's the poison work? Is it like kind of a uh, over time effect? Damage over time? Exactly. So the units that attack with poison, as well as the HQ, you'll have this, this faction will have five poison tokens that they will have, only the five. And pretty much every time there's uh, every time there's a combat command initiated where combat starts, uh, all the poison tokens will activate in one move to damage. So if for some reason my opponent's HQ has five poison tokens on it, beginning of combat, five hits right there. Okay, so the the, uh, the poisons have like the first priority in the combat resolution. Sure, okay. exactly. That's the first thing that happens. But then again, then you have these medics that you have a medic rune, a uh, heal rune in this game where if I attach this to the HQ that has all of the poisons, this will take all five, okay. because it counts as one hit. So there's different strategies. You know, If you're playing against this faction, maybe you'll want to have both of these backed up just in case, or maybe you'll want to use this faction and keep your distance and just charge in and try to keep your HQ as far away as possible. So everything is really well balanced. I do, I do have a gamer question. Um, so uh, when you have these um, stacked up, and let's say that you want to unfold, but there's only one spot. Can you just unfold one? No, and leave? the monolith has to unfold completely. completely. So entirety. if somebody can come in here and, and heat up the, and put two units here, and then that can't unfold at all. Nope. Yep. Neat. You can so lock it in. 
I got that a strategic well, it seems like that would be very part, much pretty much yeah. part of the strategy too is try to lock up a monolith yeah. uh, to keep them being able to unfold. But then you're getting all your units out there right next to their base or their banner, you know, and so you're kind of vulnerable to that yeah. as well. So you got that. Head. Some of these banners are really powerful though. So getting really close to it is not always a great move. Yeah. So for example, oh. with, this, with this faction, you don't want to be anywhere close to this because it hits poison all around and it gives poison to all of the units around it. So oh, okay. this is a yeah. faction you want to stay as far away from as possible. <laughs> and the dwarves are really hard to get into because all of them hunker down. They have a lot of toughness. They have a lot of shields. So this is a unit that you're going to have a hard time penetrating their front line to actually make it to their banner. Okay. So. Yeah. And, and just like you, well, you mentioned, like with Nirashima Hex, you know, every faction plays so differently with a mm -hmm. different approach that every time that you play, you have to change your play style based on who your opponent is too. And it looks like you're carrying that concept right over to the different asymmetrical uh, ways that each one of these factions plays as well. Exactly. And of course, the obvious question is, just like Nirashima Hex, while we have all of these different factions coming out, is this being designed to where you had the base game with the initial four, but over time you can re release new factions? Uh, that's the plan. So this, 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 uh, this theme really plays into us allowing to create a lot of really cool factions, really cool expansions. So um, it's just such a thing that Nirashima Hex fans have come to expect that that's definitely in the plan. It would also be interesting, uh, too, to see uh, if you thought about doing it like any organized play. Uh, so for having uh, in-store tournaments mm -hmm. and events where people can you know, come in and basically compete in some sort of tournament, have a prize at the end. That's definitely the case. So we, uh, Nourishima Hex is actually having a growing tournament community going on in the States. Uh, in Europe, it's an extremely popular tournament game. So in the States, it's building, it's growing. Uh, there's been some regional tournaments, and I think Gen Con is where we're going to have the kind of national championship. So we're actually having that happen at Gen Con. So it's going to hopefully naturally transfer to this game. And um, it's a completely different theme that maybe if people weren't into gamers weren't into the post-apocalyptic theme mm -hmm. of Nurishima, this theme is maybe slightly more approachable to them, and we're hoping to open up the doors to a whole new segment of the gamer population of this uh, Chaz, you've played Nurishima Hex, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, this, this is one of my all-time favorite two-player games, because I like games that are asymmetric, yes. um, it plays quick, it's very uh, strategic and tactical yes. uh, at, at the same time. So. Uh, I was excited to hear about the, uh, all the Nurishima Hex factions coming out. I, that was makes me happy enough, but realizing that we have a brand new style of game with a brand new theme and a brand new mechanic, I, I am all in. Yeah. This, this is one of those games that uh, where me and my, my co-host Tony, we can get together for lunch, we can just pull one of these out and we can yep. play under 30 minutes, knock out a quick game. You see it doesn't take a lot of space. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you've never tried Nurashima Hex, I highly recommend trying that. And if it's one of those things, like you said, if the theme doesn't appeal to you, well now you've got a brand new fantasy theme that's going to be coming out with a brand new mechanic. But what's cool is, like you said, you don't need to include these. You can just play a straight regular game of Nurashima Hex rules and leave this part out. And some of the, the But I don't know fans. that I would want to. Yeah, <laughs> not for me, but I know some diehard fans are going to get this just for the four new factions. It's like, it's Nurashima Hex, four new factions, why not? So, sure, that's true. Yeah. Well, great. Now I want it. <laughs> well, now for those who do want it, you say this is going to be available at Gen Con? The, so, Detective, our other releases, Gen Con, I'm sure you guys will be talking about that. Yes. This is coming around for Essen. 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 Okay. Essen. No, I want this for Gen Con. Uh, <laughs> so it's still got, it's still I got need some production going on. I see if I can talk to Ignatze. Yeah, okay. but, okay. Do you know what the, is it too early to know what the MSRP is going to be for it's, this? Uh, it's coming in around 50 right now. Okay, so. cool. Okay, so around f uh, 50 bucks for four factions aboard. And, uh, is there and is it going to support more than two player? I know. Sure. Yeah. So every there will be every faction will have its own monolith. Okay. Uh, knife fight in a phone booth. If you have four of them and four monoliths going all at the same time, it's going to be hectic. But I'm imagining it'll or be a lot of fun. Or do two v two. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I think I like 2v2 in Nurashima Hex just as much as one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy that, that uh, the four-player you know, uh, support yeah. for it. The rule book for this is in Polish. I don't know if I got to that section yet. I'm working through it, but uh, <laughs> I'll keep you posted. <laughs> awesome. Well, this, this is so cool. It actually brings some new stuff to Nurashima Hex uh, between the, the retheming and the new mechanism stuff. So it's like, yeah, this can stand as its own thing in addition to Nurashima Hex, right. which is really cool to see. Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you so much, Luke, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate yes. it. And we are going to take uh, about a 45-minute break or so, and then we will be right back. So in the meantime, 
Uh, in the meantime, actually, we may take even a shorter break than that. Just for you. I think it's closer to a 25 minute. We are going to be taking We'll a, be back at 2.30 Eastern time. We're going to be taking a lot shorter break than a 45 minute break. Yes. So, wow, that was, the, the time flies. It does fly <laughs> when you're having fun. So would you like a short break, Marty? Did you enjoy it? Okay, so we will be wow. back at 2.30 Eastern time to with, talk with with Rob Davio next. Rob Davio is coming up next, so you do not want to miss that, especially a man who really enjoys his food. We'll be talking about some things he's doing uh, in the board gaming uh, industry with his designs and stuff. And talk a little bit of food with Rob Davio coming up. Luke, thanks again. Thank yes, Am thank I you invited so much. to that? <laughs> you sure can. <laughs> we'll get another share. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. We'll be back in a bit.